Our guest this week on the English Hour is Mark Watts. With Mark, we'll be discussing the whole issue of the upheaval in the world that's going on, this, this protest, if you like, against the establishment that's indicated by the rise of Donald Trump, by the British Brexit vote. We'll also be discussing the whole role of the media as the media faces a new challenge from social media. And we'll be discussing investigative journalism and the role of the whistleblower. Welcome to the English Hour on ANN Satellite Television. Thank you for being here and being with us today. Um, we have a new guest, Mark Watts. Thank you so much for being our guest on ANN. It's really good to be great here. to have you. Well, three subjects. And uh, the first, that's the whole issue of, uh, well, of, of the rise. How do we describe it? The, the, the uprise in, in the... Not exactly the revolution, but the, 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 the rise in the voice of the common man and woman striking against the establishment, which has had some curious manifestations. So you could regard the Brexit vote in, in Britain as, as one aspect of this, and the other is the rise, for example, of Donald Trump in America. So that's one whole issue, and quite a wadge of an issue, too. Then we have the issue of the media. We're going to talk about the media, we're going to talk about the question, the challenges faced by the media, presented by social media, which in its own way is a huge upheaval of its own and unique. And then our third subject, which is, well, perhaps more straightforward to end with, but perhaps not, is investigative journalism and indeed whistleblowing and, and, and that whole aspect of media affairs. So thank you um, for agreeing to talk about this, this broad spectrum. And we'll move to our first subject. For some time, there has been a growing sense of anger amongst those in the West. The economy simply does not work to the advantage of many ordinary people in Britain and the United States, and has not for some time. Many feel their own positions becoming severely undermined whilst their concerns are simply deemed unimportant and brushed aside by those in power. Their anger and frustration has been felt with full force in recent months. Britain's vote to leave the European Union and the rise in support for US presidential candidate Donald Trump are a part of this bigger picture. A lack of authenticity and sincerity has plagued the established order for some time. The disparity in wealth, the immense pressure on public services and a lack of diversity have added fuel to the fire in what has become a protest against the established order. So, Mark, uh where do we begin with this? I mean, we've seen the Arab Spring in the Middle East. We've seen the whole shape of the world change. I mean, we go back a few years, and so many things have happened. The fall of the Berlin Wall. We're in a new era of history. But today, there is this anger. I sense it, anyway, this uh, real anger. It's amazing, in a way, that in the West we haven't seen a revolution. If you look at the gap between rich and poor, uh, which is unbelievable. I mean, you could have to go back to Victorian times to see the same spread between the wealthy and the poor. In our Western society, in Britain and America, um, and there is this desire to hit back. Now, you would, you would say, or, or would you, um, it's a question, not a statement. I mean, 
support for parties like UKIP, uh, support for the Brexit vote, um, goes beyond fear of violence and fear of refugees to a desire to thump the establishment, to hit the, the established <coughs> order and to, to show some, express some anger. Is that where you're coming from? Well, I think there's something in that. I mean, in a sense, you mentioned the Arab Spring. We're seeing a kind of Western Spring, mm. a kind of slightly modified version of it. And the form in which that comes is a, is a challenge to the established order, uh, to the establishment, if you like, in various different forms. And I think we've seen it manifest, for example, as you mentioned, in, in the Brexit vote uh, here in Britain. I think we're seeing a comparable uprising, that's not quite the word, a kind of a sort of uprising of a similar nature to the Brexit vote in the rest of Europe. And I think this, this mood is what has um, put Trump into the position of, uh, of being the Republican candidate and, and making a, a, a credible bid, credible at least in one sense, uh, for the US presidency. So uh, he, if he wins, and um, obviously the educated establishment money is on, on Hillary Clinton. I mean, the, the probability is Hillary Clinton would win. Well, well, well in, indeed, and what's interesting about that is, 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 is I do think that Hillary Clinton will win, but I think it's going to be quite close. And, and I think the considered view, it seems, from all the experts is that she'll win. But the considered view of all the experts is that there's no way that Trump was going to be the Republican candidate. So who knows? Mm. Yes, and indeed the considered view of the experts was that Britain wouldn't be leaving Europe. Indeed. Uh, so, so, uh, but there is also, it's uh, very curious when you look at the Trump issue. I mean, um, if you look at, if you analyze the polls thus far, you can see that he's pulled down because the, the black vote, the support amongst the black vote is almost zero. I mean, um, and similarly the Mexican vote. Uh, obviously, or the, sorry, the Latin American, whatever you say, the, mm. the uh, Hispanic, I'm sorry, is the correct phrase, isn't it? The Hispanic vote in America, uh, his support there is very weak. But curiously, if you just look at the white vote in America, he has a wodge. He's well on, he's got the majority. He's well above Hillary Clinton. The odd thing about that is that um, the black vote came out solidly for Obama. But are they, are they going to vote or are they going to stay at home? I mean, if, they, if they're for some reason the minorities uh, just don't, aren't energized to vote because they haven't got sufficient buy-in to Hillary Clinton, then Trump could, could slide in, couldn't he? He could become the next US president. Well, it, it is possible. Um, I think you just have to step back and look at the context from which this arises. And the context is um, a great antipathy towards, if you like, the establishment politicians, the politicians we've had so far, both mm. in Britain, the rest of Europe, and in America. And I think one could sum it up in one word, and it's inauthenticity. Yes. A mealy-mouthed... Um, series of answers to all questions that are posed, literally not answering the question posed and not answering the issues that people have foremost in their minds. And the attraction for many people in people like Donald Trump and indeed Nigel Farage over here, and indeed Jeremy Corbyn, by the way, mm. is authenticity. One thing you could be sure of is they say what they think and they mean what they say. Now that's actually become a bit unusual for politicians. And that's a problem because that's what people want. Almost regardless of the message, at least, you know, me think something, believe in something, and say what it is you believe. And that's what those people do often. Now, there are enormous dangers. I think there are very plain dangers in that because um, I think there's an element of just tapping into a sort of populist feeling uh, that whips up certain fears and hatreds. And I think we're seeing that both in the outcome of, uh, of the Brexit campaign here in Britain, and I think we're seeing it in America. These are underlying um, fears that are being stoked up. Uh, but on the other hand, in their favour, there is an authenticity about them. 
and, um, an unwillingness to share in the mealy-mouthed nature of most conventional politicians. Yeah, it's really powerfully said because, because something I've noticed, I mean, there's a Scots, uh, Scots motto that goes, wisdom is sincerity. And, you know, the, which, why not? I mean, sincerity, we don't see sincerity. And I kind of, that, um, uh, our former mayor of London, now our foreign secretary, Boris Johnson, um, whatever, I mean, he, come, he comes out with the most ridiculous things sometimes. But I don't think you could accuse him of being insincere. No, indeed. I think, I think there's something authentic about him. He's kind of, he, what you see is what you get. And I think that accounts for his popularity in London, bearing in mind that when he was elected as mayor of London, essentially, broadly speaking, a Labour city, mm. as a Tory candidate, he, he won. Yes. And um, I think, again, it was because of that authenticity. Uh, I mean, he tapped into something else, which is the humour, um, and he almost sort of presented himself as the, as the lovable buffoon, Yes. Now, I think that's complete nonsense <laughs> in reality, but that was what he yes, presented, yes. and it worked. It worked for Berlusconi in Italy, didn't it? Yeah. Well, there's an element of that with Trump, isn't there? Indeed. The lovable buffoon. Um, Not that uh, everyone's loving him, no, but, no, no, but maybe no, enough. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, well, I mean, he's... Uh, no, Boris is at least um, quite humanitarian in his views. I quite... I mean, I have a grudging respect for him. He was saying we should... Uh, asylum seekers, for instance, that that we should write off anybody who had been here as, how did he put it, any, any illegal migrants that have been here for more than 10 years should be just given citizenship, which was one of Boris's pledges. He may have been speaking off the cup, he yeah, usually sort of is. pledge of am an amnesty. Yes, that's right. I, I think also that came out of, uh, it, my reading of it was that he was actually genuinely surprised by the, the, the victory of the Brexit campaign, and of course he mm. was on that side of the, of the debate, and I don't think he expected that, and I'm not sure he really wanted it. Mm, interesting. Uh, I think that um, he was probably uh, unsure which, which way he, he went. We've certainly had reports that uh, he was kind of in two minds about it, and... Well, he claimed to be in two minds in the beginning. I, indeed, he, he, he uh, but I think strategically and politically, he thought that if there was a victory, that would do, do in mm. Cameron and leave the way open for him. Now, of course, we all know that didn't quite work out. The first stages happened, mm. but not the latter stages of that. And uh, I, I detected, I remember him being interviewed uh, on the radio in the immediate wake of, uh, of the victory, and I detected in his voice a certain degree of horror. Mm. Interesting. Well, he certainly got, he got a, uh, there was, I still think there was a lot of backroom negotiating, but whatever, he came out of it pretty well, didn't he? He's foreign secretary now very well positioned. Um, but never mind, that's, that's an aside from the whole thrust of our discussion. It's just a fascinating issue. But um, the, yes, so, so we have this protest against the establishment. And there's a reason for it. It is, I'm right in saying, it, you're, you're, you are right in saying that, that, of course, we view establishment politicians as being phonies because they avoid answering questions and so on. But we've tolerated that for generations. The difference now is that in, at least I assume the difference now, is that, that people are frustrated because there are big issues. I mean, food boxes for, you know, for charity boxes now in every church for people who can't afford to buy by food. There is a subculture of, of the poor. Um, there is a, a sense of frustration that things are not r going right. Well, certainly for, for many people, both in America and, and Britain, um, you know, things aren't, aren't at all good. The economy doesn't work for them. There are plenty of people in Britain for whom the economy doesn't work. And there are plenty of people, for example, in Britain for whom the free movement of people from the continent does not work. So there are certain labour markets which have found themselves undermined, if you like, by much cheaper labour from the continent, and that's left people in Britain finding their own positions undermined. Now, those people don't include the, the middle classes or, 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 or the middle classes living in metropolitan places like London, the cities. Um, 
but there were plenty of people who are in that position and they were ignored and moreover told endlessly by the politicians that your concerns are not real. Because of course those concerns yes. were not real concerns yes. for the middle yes. classes, the professional classes in the main, but they were real concerns for many white working class people living in the provinces. And not in addition to that, there was a, a genuine pressure on services, which again was being ignored. And so you had a kind of race to the bottom. You're having a race to the bottom in terms of the labor market. And uh, it, at a time of austerity in terms of public services, them coming under greater yes, pressure. Yes. Now, all this has been brushed aside and, oh, that's not a problem, don't worry about it. But people have said, no, it is a problem. And I am worried about it. Mm. And that is why, in my view, the Brexit vote happened. Of course, there are many other reasons that it's more complicated than that, but I think that was a driving force. It wasn't really about getting out of Europe. It's about stopping free movement of people. Mm. And, and, as you say, and punching the establishment. I mean, part of the, if I look at my own personal anger, um, I, at the last general election, found it impossible to vote Labour or Tory or Liberal. And I ended up voting Green. Um, just just because that was all I could think of that I felt some and why I was so irritated by the 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 lack of difference as I saw it between the three major parties uh, all of whom had failed to really kick the the bankers and and so on the 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 those that had milked the country uh, for which the next generation be paying um, so, um, so I voted Green. It was my protest vote. Uh, and, and then what happened was, I think, there were, if, I, if my memory serves correctly, there were 1.2 million people who did that in Britain mm. at the last election. And the result of that 1.2 million votes was one MP. Mm. And a similar phenomenon for people who voted UKIP. Mm. Now, mm. this is not democratic, is it, in any no. real sense? And this really gets starts annoying people. Yeah. And I think this all feeds into this disaffection that there is with the political est uh, establishment, the political system that we have at the moment. Interesting. Well, well, that's, I mean, we, we need to move on to our second topic because believe it or not, we've, we've already used up a wadge of our time. But that's fascinating because that really has broadened my own thought because I realize that I'm, um, well, it's nice to think that I'm part of a movement. <laughs> You know, <laughs> that gives me a sense of belonging. I'm not the only one who feels this anger at the establishment um, in the West. And, and it's lovely, this, this idea that um, th there's kind of uprising in, in thinking that uh, the establishment needs to watch out. Let's move on. We, we, we have talked about that, and now we have to talk about social media and the media. And that challenge. New communication technologies have modified and reshaped the role of mainstream news publishers. The ability to easily publish online through blogs or social media allows the public to effectively report on current events. Online channels have not only provided new platforms for citizens to express themselves, but also a space to correct mainstream media. Mainstream news outlets are sometimes subject to governmental pressures and financial restrictions which can result in bias. Social media has the power to correct. This power to correct was important in the context of campaigns like Black Lives Matter, as well as on a still larger scale during events such as the Arab Spring or the Iranian elections. Meanwhile, mainstream news outlets are increasing their presence online, tapping into the power of social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Simultaneously, new media forums have emerged that are fully internet dependent, as in the case of ProPublica in the United States and BuzzFeed. The internet has utterly changed the media scene forever, forcing us into a brave new world in which the dissemination of information is pluralist and mainstream media are better held to account. So the media. 
Now, Mark, we're, we're talking about a world in which everything has changed for the media, the social media, everything has changed for everybody. I, I, I stood for an election four years ago, and I stood for an election this year, just a minor election, a, a local election in the Southwest. But four years, I lost both times, by the way, but that's neither here nor there. Four, I stood as an independent, I didn't have much chance. But four years ago, um, I stood and I was doing the occasional public meeting. A handful of people turned up, but that was where the campaigning was. This year when I stood, Facebook took over. I mean, just, and you couldn't keep up. It was, and you were putting up a post and it would reach 17,000 people or something. And, and, you, and you couldn't keep up with the comments. So social media um, all over the world has become such a force. It's just unbelievable, really. And I think it would change the shape of our politics uh, very swiftly. But the pressure on journalists, well, what is the pressure? Well, you, you define that. Well, I think one thing, um, the first thing to say is that in the same way as there's a challenge to the established order within the political sphere, exactly the same thing is going on in parallel in the media sphere. Mm. And, um, and, and in the media sphere specifically, we have, have two things really operating. We have things that are undermining um, the mainstream media as it exists at the moment in economic terms, collapse in advertising revenue for newspapers, for example. Mm. Uh, uh, and at the same time, we're seeing the rise of new media outlets, mostly enabled by, um, by, the, by the internet, essentially. Um, obviously, my own organization, although it closed recently, um, but uh, XRO was... Actually, we should pause and say something about XRO, because they're very good organization and doubtless we'll but um but just explain just just i will come back but just explain Excel. so we were running investigative stories and, and stories that otherwise simply wouldn't have uh, have appeared and what was in one of the things that was interesting is that the mainstream media was forced to take them up you know we were we were not being ignored we were having a huge impact um in terms of the rest of the media uh, following up our material and we were quite often working with with mainstream media on specific stories and uh, we had a series of uh, of scoops on a whole range of subjects because it was uh, a remarkably good basically website based platform uh on which you exposed stories whistleblowing whatever you you put it and and it was Phenomenal, because you were doing things that others didn't. That's right. And then, um, and it closed very recently because of funding issues, because yes. uh, because you didn't have a funder. Um, but uh, and and see that has happened when we've seen in America ProPublica springing up, and and we've seen BuzzFeed, uh, which has a huge audience for what it was known for previously, the the lists, endless lists. Um, and, and actually doing news and even investigations. It's had one quite significant hit already. Mm. Um, and we've got over here in, in, in London the Bureau of Investigative Journalism uh, as well. So we have these new outlets, um, which I'm not sure they could really exist were it not for the internet. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be very hard. Perhaps the TBIJ could, uh, the Bureau, which is philanthropically uh, funded. Um, but this also poses a challenge to the media because Quite often what happened with XRO, you know, there's a huge audience that says, well, we do want to read these stories, actually. Why, why isn't the mainstream media doing this stuff? Mm. Um, and, and in the past, the mainstream media could sort of get away with ignoring a lot of very significant stories because who would kind of know on a broader scale who would be able to call them out on it? Mm. And they I would be called out on it now. Um, social media has a, has a part to play in that, although I wouldn't overstate the importance of social media. I think it's in the balance to how much impact that's going to have. I think the real impact will come from a whole uh, range of new entities, some of which may not yet have even formed. I would hope that social media will help journalism lift its standards because journalism will have to fill a different place. We used to, I mean, my father was a journalist and he used to say, a story without a source is a source of trouble, um, which is one of his little maxims. Another one was, when in doubt, cut it out. And um, 
British journalists, as opposed to American journalists, I know this because my daughter is a journalist who works for an American paper and for the Washington Post and formerly used to work for a British paper, the, the Telegraph, bless their hearts. And, um, the, um, and I know for a fact that there are, they, they really give them a hard time if there's an unsourced story. They have to know, they don't have to quote their sources, but they have to have sources and the editor will demand that they have sources at the Washington Post. British papers are much laxer about that kind of thing. If we want to separate clear blue water between the social media um, and the sort of citizen journalist, which is what we're talking about, and the professional journalist, then the professional journalist has got to be reliable and has got to really be, um, have proper sources and source material. And then that sets them apart from the citizen journalist who might say anything. And they're, they're, they're a value. Wouldn't you say that? Is that a, a divide that we need or we should have? Or Yes. I, I mean, I think it's easy to, to sort of overdo the, the, the failures of mainstream media, say, in Britain. But, of course, you can point to lots of successes over, over the years, individual mm. successes. Um, but I think the, the, the real problem is that there's almost a veneer, almost a show of holding... Um, power to account. You know, we'll have the, the ritual of the minister grilled uh, on a breakfast radio mm. station or breakfast television. But how much of that is real and how much of it is show? Is, is power really being held to account? And I think there's real doubt about whether the mainstream media has been doing that, particularly here in, in Britain. And the, the, the reason why um, something like x got traction was because it was doing that and it was mm. genuinely doing that. Interesting. So, I mean, if you relate that to the Middle East, uh, there's the classic situation of the Iraq war or the fall of Saddam, the liberation of Iraq. Uh, you could argue that that was an instance in which the British media failed to hold the establishment. Well, uh, it's a in very interesting example because I think the real problem, you're saying, uh, you were wondering about, you know, how reliable are, are um, newspaper sources. The real problem, of course, is that lots of sources lie. And in particular, the problem for, for the media over here is manipulation by um, essentially governments in, in the broadest yes. sense of that word. And that can be very explicit and sometimes less, rather more underhand. And if you take the example of the build-up to the second invasion of Iraq by the West, um, in essence, the public was told a lie repeatedly by the mainstream media, which was the government's lie, of course. Uh, the mainstream media didn't have any reason to challenge it, which was that Iraq had, at that point, you know, weapons of mass destruction. Now, what was interesting is I actually made a, a programme for British television some years before about the real programme that Iraq had previously back in the 80s and how it had been dismantled by a series of UN inspection teams. Now anyone like me, any journalist who had poured through the material of those UN inspection reports and indeed watched the videos of the stuff actually being dismantled knew that what we were being told in the build-up to that war was a lie. And what I found at the time when I would raise this in newsrooms is, ah, oh, but your information is out of date, it's all changed now. Mm. And one of the things that was interesting about that was when Robin Cook resigned as Foreign Secretary, I saw him being interviewed on television, making the same point, saying, look, I've seen the intelligence when I was Foreign Secretary, and it just isn't there. And he was challenged with, ah, oh, yes, but you've resigned, maybe it's changed now, you don't know the latest intelligence. So, in a way, the information was there to be found by journalists, but it broadly wasn't. They took, as it were, the spin, and it was complete and utter baloney. Mm. Yeah, very sad. I mean, uh, the, we, that's why I wonder, I mean, one of the most dangerous sources is an intelligence agency source, and we use them all the time. Um, if, and often it, uh, you, you, journalists will say a government source. I think they should be much more credible if we distinguished and said when it was an intelligence services source because 
Although I suppose you don't know. I think more often, to be frank, when, when you read government source number, source number 10 and so on, that, that'll be a, a, a spin doctor, that'll be a, yeah. a press officer, a communications officer or whatever, yeah. working on behalf of, of government. Mm. What about, um, so we can't blame the intelligence agencies as much as... Oh, I'm sure you can, and, and, and that has a part to play, but, but yeah. I, I don't think very much of it's coming directly from uh, intelligence sources. What about the, um, so we have this situation. What about the, the modern journalists? One of the other problems is embedded journalists, isn't it? Uh, if you go back an entire generation to the time of the Vietnam War, we didn't have embedded journalists to the same degree. I mean, people wandered around and often get killed, but, but essentially the journalist was in the field and he wasn't... Uh, he didn't have one whacking great marine on this side and one whacking great... I know... Um, I mean, it's, it's so comfortable, isn't it? If I go to Iraq or somewhere, I'll, I'll hope that the government is going to provide me with a couple of soldiers because I get frightened. But, you know, but nonetheless... The old, the, we have far too many, uh, we're talking about conflicts, we have far too many embedded journalists, perhaps, and, um, and the, the downside of this is uh, when, for example, we have to bomb somewhere to liberate it, you know, I mean, very often we don't, we don't get the full picture. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right, but I think there are, there are real difficulties raised uh, by it, and, I, and, and I'm not sure the answer is simply to avoid doing it altogether. I think really the answer lies in just being frank with your audience about what you've, what you've done, what restrictions you were working under. Mm. And on the whole, I think that probably happens. And, and so I, I'm not sure it's really an option for, uh, for the media to just turn down those facilities, as they're mm. called, yeah. because, they're pr because they probably wouldn't have an alternative way of getting anywhere near, as it were, literally the scene of battle. Um, so it does represent some real difficulties, and, and I think it's important to acknowledge that they, that they do and, and not to pretend that you've got a free hand, because you clearly haven't. And what about, without casting any blame on any side, I just, what about the hidden wars like Yemen? Uh, I mean, um, well, Yemen is classic at the moment. It's a, it's, a, it's a war. There are no reporters to speak of in Yemen. Um, people are starving in Yemen. Um, what can we say? I mean, I have to, saying that, people, uh, Darfur is apparently a complete catastrophe at this moment. And it, I mean, um, people in terrible misery and, and huge numbers of people have suffering and an ongoing major war, and we're not reporting it. Um, well, see, I mean, I did say r r early on in, in this segment about the challenge of the economic situation that, that the media finds itself in. And, and, and you know, newspapers have massively cut back on journalists, um, and in particular, journalists working overseas. Hmm. To send a journalist to a, a country where conflict may be going on is, is in a very expensive business, and, 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 and they don't necessarily feel they have the resources to do that in the way they might have done in the past. Hmm. Is that, I mean, we used to have press barons that were happy to lose money. Um, uh, obviously, the, the present owner of the Washington Post is happy to do so. He has Amazon books, doesn't he, to, to fill his pockets. But, um, but the, the great press, press barons who didn't care about losing fortunes have gone, I guess, haven't they? We're, and so the, you, you, don't, you don't have the subsidized press in the way that... Well, some newspapers still operate at a loss, in fact. Um, and, and I think the, the thing is, I, I, I certainly wouldn't be harking back to a time of even more powerful press barons. Mm. Um, I think the answer really does lie in plurality. And so, so I, I think we're living, I'm actually quite hopeful about where we are journalistically, about at least where the prospects are, because we are seeing new organisations spring up. Some will work, some will not. And I think we'll see many more to come. And, and it's possible to do that with the, the technological advance we've seen in recent uh, years. And I think that plurality is terribly important. We don't want to have just, you know, one form of media. Interesting. So, and, and therefore, as part of that mix, the, the upheaval being called so, caused by social media is a good thing, really. It's, uh, well, it would be, wouldn't it? I mean, it comes with its downside because you don't know what 
what to trust. Yeah, so, and one thing to bear in mind with social media is that there's a sense, I mean, you can only really have much influence if you've got an audience. And, and of course, the established media players automatically, as it were, have an audience. Mm. So, so new players, I mean, you take when x started, we literally started from scratch. We weren't part of some other group. So, you know, we had literally mm. zero fo followers on Twitter on day one because we were coming out of nothing. Mm. Um, interestingly, BuzzFeed is in a slightly different position because, of course, they built an audience um, from other material which they can tap into. Now they're doing sort of more serious news. Um, but you need to have an audience to, for, for it to have any impact. Um, and, and you'll find that a lot of the established voices are actually the ones with, with, with that audience in social media as well as in, as it were, old media. Interesting. We've got. I mean, we can talk on about this. I can certainly talk on about this with you for some time because I find it fascinating. But we. I think one thing that's worth saying is that in as we see these challenges, both in the political mm. sphere um, and in the media sphere, of course, the challenges, but they haven't, as it were, overcome yet. You could say Brexit is perhaps a mark of that um, incursion, mm. and I'm not I'm not necessarily saying it's a good thing, but I'm saying it's a represents that. Um, that, that, that's overthrowing of the established order, which that definitely represents in, in, a, in a sense. Um, but broadly speaking, we have still the same political parties running the show in Britain and in America, and we essentially have uh, the same media companies running the show uh, as well. But, you know, there are challenges to that, and, and I think it will change over, over time. But it hasn't entirely changed yet. Right. Ah, okay. What's it's that? a slow revolution. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. It's a French expression, isn't there one? I can never, uh, my French is so, is, is awful. Tout ça change, tout ça c'est la même chose, or something of that kind. Uh -huh. Yeah, nothing changes. It's all the same. But, but it does change. Thank you. We, 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 we have another subject to discuss. Um, investigative, we've touched on it, actually, but, but we'll focus more clearly on it. Investigative journalism and, uh, and, the, and the question of the whistleblower. A society which the establishment rules without a constructive avenue for opposition is not a healthy one. Investigative journalism and whistleblowing have long been a key channel for the expression of dissatisfaction with the establishment in the West, with every small revelation being used as ammunition by the people against those associated with government. Most notably in the UK, successive child sex scandals uncovered by investigative journalists have fueled an appetite for attacking the governing class. Nevertheless, investigative journalism is itself under attack by the accountants at media outlets. It is perceived as being expensive and often unproductive whilst others argue it serves a vital purpose. Mark, the, the question of, well, investigative journalism. Um, a, are we losing it? I mean, we used to have the old Sunday Times Insight team, which would hammer away at a story and then come out with some revelation. I mean, are those days gone? Um, and then there's the whole, well, we come to the whole issue of whistleblowing, which is one that's fascinating. But, but what about the, the uh, investigative journalism? We, do we don't, no longer have the budgets? It's not happening? I think that's a massive factor for mainstream media in the same way I mentioned earlier that this is depleted foreign coverage. Well, one of the other things that's been depleted as a consequence of the economics that the media finds itself in uh, in recent years has been the uh, diminution of investigative journalism. There's a perception uh, in, in the sort of managerial class within newspapers that it's very expensive. And I'm not so sure it's really true, but there is a perception that it is. It's certainly less certain. And what I mean by that is if you have, uh, you know, a nominal journalist working away on an investigation for some time, they could be working away for weeks, months, longer, and at the end of it, have nothing to, mm. nothing to publish. Whereas if you have that same journalist sat behind a terminal, like they're working in some bank, just mm. rewriting wire copy that 
spews in and they spew it out, you get a lot more words, you know, mm. per day worked. And I'm afraid, you know, the real enemy of investigative journalism has been the accountant. It's not the lawyer, it's the accountant. And it's the accountant who says, in sitting in newspaper offices and television companies, that this doesn't make sense economically. The only problem with that accountant's analysis is they've completely ignored the audience. The audience isn't interested in all this stuff that's being spewed out and regurgitated and, you know, spin doctors reworked words. This mm. is all drivel and nonsense. People don't care about that. They're turned off by it. They want the real stuff, which is what investigative journalism is. Um, but nonetheless, there has been a diminution. It hasn't completely gone. Yeah. Um, you know, newspapers still do it here and there, um, and indeed in broadcast as well. But it has certainly in Britain um, definitely uh, dropped. And the primary reason, I think, is comes down to the economics of the industry. Mm, money. So uh, if you if you had to um, best example of best practice in terms of still keeping some sort of standard of investigative journalism there. Would you say the Financial Times? I mean, would you pick on, uh, can, you, can you see other flagship uh, particular broadcasters or, or that you would, you would highlight as, as still waving the flag? Uh, uh, well, certainly in, in recent years, I'd, I'd probably point to uh, something like World in Action, which was broadcast by ITV. Mm. I, I did work for it. Uh, I had two spells in World in Action. Um, but of course, that's no longer no longer there. Mm. Um, and, and one of the things that's happened as there's been a diminution in mainstream media is we have seen new things springing up, both in Britain and America. And this is really where Exero came from. Yes. I mean, the history there was that just before we launched, a couple of years before we launched, the Daily Telegraph ran um, a series of investigative pieces about MPs' expenses having obtained some data that went into great detail about what expenses they were claiming. Mm. Uh, and, they, and they had to do quite a lot of work with this data to make sense of it, as it were. And they did a, a fantastic job. And one of the things that did is it reminded everyone that actually investigative journalism is what people are interested in. The sales of the paper you know, went through the ceiling. They couldn't, the mm. shops were selling out of the, of the paper. And of course, the paper was being mentioned en endlessly. Uh, in the rest of the media because it really struck home. And people were outraged by it, funny enough, feeding into precisely what we were talking about in the first segment of this programme, uh, 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 this kind of disaffection with, with politics. Mm. Politicians were caught out um, by that investigation. So Extro came along in that context where people were suddenly reminded, people in our own industry were reminded, that actually, this is good, isn't it? This is what people want. And within a very short space of time of our launching, we ran um, an investigation which started with just a single story about a single example of um, the chief executive of the student loans company who it turned out wasn't on the payroll but was working and being paid via a personal services company mm. meaning that he could choose the level of tax that he paid rather than paying tax as, a, as an employee. Mm. Now, what was interesting was that as soon as we broke the story, we first of all worked with a mainstream media outlet on it. So it, we, we uh, put it out at the same time as Newsnight, uh, the BBC program that we worked with on that. And of course, the rest of the media immediately picked up on it because it, it clearly was a terrific story. So here we were, a brand new entity, you know, tiny, suddenly, um, you know, causing <laughs> ructions, yes, yes. causing an urgent debate in Parliament the next day, a review into Whitehall. So, so the point about investigative stories is they have real impact and people really care about them. Of course they do. I, I mean, they really matter. Uh, what, just, well, clearly we need more investigative journalism. Um, so it begs the question, Exaro, Exaro is, 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 has gone down uh, because of lack of independent funding. Um, are we going to see investigative journalism of the kind we need to see? Is, there, is it going to happen? Well, I, th I, I feel quite hopeful about, the, despite everything I've said, I actually feel quite hopeful about the state of investigative journalism in, in this country and wider because, one, I think... Things like Exera have reminded people that we absolutely need it, and, and, and there's a real, mm. the audience wants it. Um, and I think, although I don't really see the mainstream media going back to, as it were, 
days of the past where they devoted more resources to it than they do now. What I do see is new entities springing up to do it. And we have seen that already. Um, and I think we'll see more of that. Does it have to be um, funded? I mean, obviously, it is miles better if it is. But is there room um, using a forum or platform like Ixaro to, to open it up and say to the citizen journalist or to the professional journalist who wants to do something on the side, you know, okay, here's a platform, use it. Um, I mean, obviously, we'll have to have some oversight, but nonetheless, that within those bounds, use it. And, and uh, uh, because, I mean, there are platforms for citizen journalism, but it tends to be, uh, I mean, I know some very good ones, uh, but um, uh, they tend to be platforms more for photographers and, yes. and, and so on. Um, I think when it comes to investigative journalism, um, a, a certain level of professionalism is needed. It's not that easy to do. And um, you actually need journalists to spend quite a bit of time on a, a given subject. You know, where, where, although I don't think, although I think uh, accountants in newspapers have, have kind of got carried away with how expensive investigative journalism is, there is nonetheless cost involved because you do need journalists to work away for quite a long period of time. And that might be searching out sources. It might be just talking at great length with whistleblowers. And it inevitably is pouring through documents uh, or, or other material of that type. And, and this does take time. And um, I don't really see people doing that on a sort of amateurish basis, on an unpaid basis. Um, because I, d I just don't really see that's very practical. It does have to be funded. Interesting. So, now, the other side of the coin, which you just touched on, whistleblowers, um, who are, well, not all investigative journalism requires whistleblowers, but... It generally does. Yeah. Well, now, there, there, are, there are issues here. I mean, for a start, there's the morality issue. Um, for example, I was at a conference this summer on Ukraine, uh, and we, I attended a session on, well, the conference wasn't exclusively on Ukraine, it was on just governance, but anyway, the U Ukraine was a dimension of it. And I attended a session in which they were talking about uh, corruption, and they were talking about this, and it became, and it was all Ukrainians talking about corruption, because corruption is a huge issue in Ukraine. And it became clear, very clear, very swiftly, that uh, whistleblowing was being used by uh, one side to blacken the name of the other, and vice versa. In other words, the whistleblowers were often um, as corrupt as the person they were whistleblowing about. But they wanted, to get, they wanted to do the dirt on the other guy. It was u used entirely for political motives. Um, and curiously enough, in the Middle East, I've seen this in Syria, uh, where people do this kind of thing. And it happens all over the place. Um, does that matter? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure that sounds like a, what I would call a whistleblower. A whistleblower is somebody who's inside an organization right. and who um, is giving you insight into what's going on in that organization, telling you about it and providing, say, documentary evidence about it. Now, that doesn't preclude the possibility that they have some strange vested interest or they have an axe to grind, as, as we say, um, which you need to watch out for. But, but, but a whistleblower is really someone who works for an organization and is speaking out to you as a journalist. Uh, and the thing is, not surprisingly, organizations don't like this. They don't like the journalist and they like the whistleblower even less. And you know, we see, particularly in Britain, um, a kind of anti-whistleblower sentiment. I mean, I think this is deep-rooted in our culture, actually. But is there, is there even a morality issue there? If you're, uh, you're, you're sort of, you're betraying your employer, aren't you, or something? Well, possibly. Um, uh, it might, it, it invariably involves that, but it depends what it is you're, you're revealing. If you're revealing something that, um, you know, some corruption or malpractice that is putting the public in danger or is just... Um, um, is somehow contrary to the public interest, then 
actually some people have a duty to speak out. And what about the hugely controversial, I mean, the flagship whistleblowers, Edward Snowden mm -hmm. or something like this? Um, they're right or they're right? I mean, it, it, becomes, it becomes an argument, doesn't it, when you get, um, you could argue both ways. Uh, well, clearly the argument has been had both ways. I think one thing you have to recognise with all um, very successful pieces of investigative journalism. We certainly experienced, experienced this at Exero, particularly with our investigation into child sex abuse by VIPs, and the Guardian certainly had it with the Snowden revelations, is you do get a backlash. You know, the more you hit home, the more the backlash. Mm. And so inevitably, because in that case you had an identified whistleblower in Snowden, you know, he is endlessly going to be briefed against by the machinery of the state much of the rest of the media is going to be manipulating into running whatever rubbish uh, to try and uh, undermine and, and discredit the whistleblower. And as I say, there's a great uh, tendency to do that because organisations don't like you know, the world to know what skullduggery they may be up to. And if there's any organisation that doesn't like it, it's going to be something like the NSA. <laughs> yes, well, quite. Yes. So, so we, we've got... We've got these people. Um, I guess we could guard as heroes, couldn't we? I mean, um, WikiLeaks. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, they cause a lot of trouble. They are, but they're, they're necessary, I guess. That's right, isn't it? They are necessary. We need our whistleblowers. Yeah, they're vital. They're vital. Yeah, yeah. And actually what we need, we need to see real change in terms of protecting whistleblowers. If, 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 if indeed people have come forward to spill the beans, as it were, on something that really has gone wrong in an organisation, they shouldn't be hounded uh, mm. in the way that they are. Uh, they, 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 they should be encouraged to do it. You know, perhaps if we had um, greater protection from whistleblowers, the enormous problem that has developed in Britain over decades over child sex abuse I don't think it would be on anything like the same scale if people felt they could blow the whistle. And that might include, for example, people who work in the care home system, mm -hmm. the social services, indeed the police. I mean, even now, um, as, as the issue of, of child sex abuse and the failure to investigate it by the authorities in the past comes to light, we still have a situation where former police officers are scared to come forward and talk because they are subject to the Official Secrets Act. And although some, some sort of assurances have been given, in fact by Theresa May when she was Home Secretary, that they won't be prosecuted, the truth is that it's less than clear cut, at least that's what those ex-police officers are telling me. Mm. So, so the, uh, yes, it's extraordinary, isn't it, that, that you, can, you can use a tool weapon like the Official Secrets Act to protect those that have been conducting crimes. Um, it's, it's extraordinary. The, that whole thing of, of sex abuse, child sex abuse, I mean, you, as, at Exaro, you had a major role in exposing that. Um, and it goes on. Uh, the, the, actually, I was, I was staggered. The post I stood for, a political post I stood for in the in the southwest and lost was a police commissioner, and I was staggered by the. It's not just child abuse; the sheer level of violence in our society. I mean, uh, abuse, family abuse, um, uh, man, men beating up women, men beating up men, the abuse in um, in the gay community between men and men. You know. The, the, the violence everywhere, the trafficking of women, uh, the, the, the subculture of part of our society is, uh, is so broken. The levels of rape in British society are just staggering in, 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 in many places. Um, you get, uh, and, and, you, and you think we live so complacently and we think that this society is so perfect in the West, and, and there is this underbelly uh, of, of hurt. Well, one of the things that we caused to happen at X-Ray was this overarching inquiry into child sex abuse, which is looking specifically into mm. 
institutional, possible institutional failures. Mm. And, and, and I mean, there are many issues for it to be looking at and it will be working for many, many years, but it will address questions such as, why was it that Cyril Smith, according to the DPP, mm. uh, the recent DPP, this is, uh, for our should have been prosecuted. This is a famous member of parliament, yes. uh, a uh, member of the Liberal Party in Britain and, and was a major figure on our political scene, now dead, but, but yes. Why and and the DPP came out with a statement saying yeah. that he ought to have been prosecuted yeah. on three occasions in the past, but wasn't, yeah. because the evidence was strong enough to, to, to charge him, but it didn't happen. Yes, so the the, uh, again, just for you, the Department of Public Prosecution, Director of Public, Prosecution, Director of yes. Public in, in the UK. Um, because... Uh, and it will be looking at the, the, the Church of England, yes, the yes. Catholic Church, um, the care home system. I mean, it's going to be looking at almost every institution, even political parties. Mm. Excellent. Well, I'm glad of that. I just lament the closure of Ex Exaro. Uh, I, hope, I hope it's resurrected and resurrected soon because you've done tremendous work. The work will continue in one form or another. Well, bless you. And thank you for giving us your time. It's really been fascinating. Bless you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. So, what have we learnt? I, do you know, I'm, I really loved the first section when we were discussing the whole business of the justification of the people when they protest against the establishment. Um, in the Middle East, of course, that was violent protest with the Arab Spring. In the West, we had our kind of protest, and it's been softer, but the establishment had best pay attention. We had the Brexit vote. The establishment continues to ignore the people, and we may see the election of Donald Trump in America. Uh, the people can't be taken for granted. And what do we want from the establishment? What we want is something more than honesty. Honesty is simply not good enough. We want something more than integrity. Integrity is simply not good enough. What we want is sincerity. We don't see it. We see little and little and little enough sincerity in our politicians. We expect, we demand, and we deserve sincerity from the political class that leads us. Then the issue of, of journalism. Uh, journalism today is outstanding, but fewer and fewer are bearing a heavier and heavier burden. Journalists are hard pressed, they work hard, uh, and they, they do have to draw their own firm standards, they do need standards, uh, ethical standards. When in doubt, cut it out. It's a very good maxim for a journalist. But, um, and social media will challenge us all. It will change the world. I think it's a hugely positive thing. It'll build a better world for us all, I hope. Um, the, the Facebook generation are going to be the generation I hope that puts an end to war. We've been waiting for a generation to do that. Why not? It's about time. In any case, we need investigative journalism. We need the whistleblowers. We need to challenge the establishment. We must have that. And how we go about that, Mark was perhaps right, that needs funding. You can't, you can't, that's not really the the easiest arena for the citizen journalist who works for nothing. So, which way forward? I hope we do find a way to see newspapers with deeper po pro pockets who can fund proper investigative journalism. Anyway, let's think about it, you and I. We, we cannot see a world without the challenge to the establishment presented by investigative journalism. Thank you for being with us and thank you for being our guests on ANN Satellite Television.